This is the type of stuff that the FBI, frankly, was created for, is to give that level of expertise that local law enforcement just doesn't have or access to. Nearly one year after the quadruple homicide that shocked the nation, FBI agents are headed back to the scene of the crime in the University of Idaho murders. They're going to take one last crack at this, so to speak, and they're going to be able to argue that this was a fresh look, that they didn't do anything. They're not retesting the same stuff. This is re new stuff that they're testing. It's a case Law and Crime Network has followed since the beginning, when the bodies of four college students were found brutally murdered on November 13th of last year. All four victims were students at the University of Idaho in Moscow. For weeks, we covered the developing story as authorities gave few clues about the investigation. But in late December, suspect Brian Koberger was arrested and later charged in all four murders. It alleges that the defendant, Brian C. Koberger, on or about November 13th of 2022, in Lake County, State of Idaho, did unlawfully enter a residence located at 1122 King Road, Moscow, with the intent to commit the felony crime of murder. Now, FBI agents are back at the King Road crime scene for what's likely the final time. Former FBI agent Colin Schmidt tells Law and Crime Network the investigation will be strategic ahead of Koberger's jury trial. It appears that they wanted the evidence response team of the FBI, since they're having this pause in the court case, to go in there and do start doing some 3D modeling of the crime scene. Prosecutors say Koberger is responsible for the stabbing deaths of Zana Kernodal, Ethan Chapin, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Gonzalez. Investigators used DNA recovered from a knife sheath left at the crime scene to connect Koberger to the case. He was arrested at his parents' home in Pennsylvania before he was extradited to Idaho. Detectives arrested 28-year-old Brian Christopher Koberger in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania on a warrant for murder of Ethan, Zena, Madison, and Kaylee. Since then, Koberger has been held at the Latah County Jail in Moscow, only about a mile and a half from the murder scene. He was set to stand trial last month, but that was delayed indefinitely after prosecutors argued they needed more time to create models of the home to present to jurors. Schmidt says that's what this new investigation is all about. The FBI ERT evidence response team is going in there and they want to get a really perfect 3D model of what happened. So when they have to present all this evidence in court, uh, the jury is going to really know exactly what happened. As Schmidt explains, investigators will use the Faro technique, 3D technology that, according to its website, quote, allows you to capture complete, accurate views of the on-scene evidence and generate photorealistic 360-degree views of the space. Schmidt says the FBI has been utilizing this technique for years. I was a part of the San Bernardino shooting investigation back in 2015 as a supervisor. And during that investigation, uh, our evidence response team actually went in and unfortunately they had to do this with the bodies still in place and they set up lasers and they were using the Faro technique or the Faro uh, uh, equipment back then. And basically what that means is they're using LIDAR technology to actually create a 3D model of the crime scene and then so that it can be presented in court. So uh, there was it was done in, in two phases, one with the bodies in place and then once all the bodies were removed from the San Bernardino shooting site, they, they did it again to make sure they had a, an accurate depiction of actually what happened. For the University of Idaho crime scene, Schmidt tells us they'll use the Faro technique to collect images and measurements. So using LiDAR, believe it or not, we have LiDAR on our phones. So it's actually this little button right here on our iPhones and it's used basically, and what LiDAR stands for is light detection and ranging technology. And it's used for 3D crime scene, recon 3D crime scene re reconstruction, but for our purposes on phones, we use it for low light photos uh, to basically get an autofocus. But investigators will have to work fast. The University of Idaho that owns the home agreed to open it to FBI agents for only two days, October 31st and November 1st. Two days means means 48 hours. So they'll be in there for 48 hours. They'll be in there around the clock. They have almost a limitless resources. So in this case, if they need to bring in teams from LA, from uh, um, 
Seattle, from New York. All these teams have the same training, and then some of them have specialized training. Uh, so there's no doubt that they'll stay in there in two days. Will obviously the FBI wants five days or ten days, but in two days they will plan for it and make sure they have the appropriate resources there to get the job done. As Long Crime Network reported, the university intends to demolish the home, but those plans were stalled back in January when the defense motioned to preserve the crime scene. Family members of the victims agree with this move. A statement from the Gonzalez family and Jeff Kernodal, the father of Zana, reads in part, quote, As the family has stressed from the beginning of the investigation, the King Road house is one of the most critical pieces of evidence in the case. We are grateful that the University of Idaho listened to the family's concerns and delayed the demolition of the home. Isn't that the whole point of not destroying evidence? You may not know if you need it until later, or it may become more important when a jury hears evidence in the case. According to Schmidt, jurors are the driving force in this new investigation. He says prosecutors likely feel the 3D model is vital to their case. This was such a horrific, horrific crime. The prosecutors there, they want to get it right. And you only get one chance in front of a jury to get it right. You, 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 can't, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. So they have this opportunity to put this evidence in front of the jury that is going to be exact, absolute precise depiction of what happened. So the jury understands how horrific this was and how well, how he did what he did, because there is quite a few questions about, well, how could he go in and do these things? And, and the other, the survivors didn't hear him or didn't understand or didn't uh, step up and stop him from doing this. Well, this 3D model is going to show the jury, well, this is how he did it. This is how he was able to get away with doing these horrific things without anybody hearing him as he was uh, basically executing his victims. Schmidt says information collected during this new investigation could help put things into perspective for future jurors. The, the most important thing for a, a juror is to understand context, especially in a murder investigation or murder scene. So uh, apparently there was a, a sheath, I believe, that was found and the, the juror needs to see how that sheath where the sheath was found in conjunction with the bodies so they can make that connection because everything is layered because the sheath led to his identification using forensic genealogy and then why would a sheath be there you know all these questions because ultimately the, the objective of the fbi ert is to anticipate any questions that the juror might have jurors might have and answer those questions before they even come into the juror's mind but more than just viewing a model of the King Road home, experts say jurors could be taken to the scene of the crime. And I anticipate that's going to happen. And there's going to be an argument by the defense not to see this 3D modeling before they walk through, because then the, the defense is going to say they're being biased by what the, the FBI's depiction or of the, the crime scene. So I'm sure the jurors are going to want to see what happened there. They're going to walk through. They're only going to see basically completely empty rooms. I mean, the carpet's going to be ripped up because the FBI is going to pull out of that carpet, take it back to the lab and go through it with in a microscopic manner. Uh, so I don't, they're not, in my opinion, they're not going to get a lot of context from these empty rooms. I think the, the 3D modeling is going to give them a lot more context. Uh, but I anticipate that even though there, there's going to be argument why you're not going to get anything out, I think the jurors will still want to go just to see, you know, just to, in their own mind, hey, what really happened? But long before jurors would ever set foot in the house, investigators will use this time to look for new evidence. Now, the first phase of this is the ERT of the FBI is going to go in, they're going to do another search and they're going to look for hairs, follicles, any DNA, anything that might be missing, any microscopic uh, uh, pieces of evidence that they might be able to uh, draw another connection to the, uh, the person that's on, on trial right now. Then after that, then they'll start setting up their equipment and their, the, the LIDAR technology, and then they'll start creating their 3D models of, of what happened in that house. What is the probability that they find something almost a year after these murders? You were talking about microscopic hairs or some sort of evidence. I mean, is that likely that they could have passed over it the first couple times that they were investigating? 
it, it is likely depending on the, uh, and I'm giving the lawyer answer, it depends. So it depends on what level of of evidence response team they had to go in there the first time. Schmidt believes this will be the final time investigators collect anything from the home. So I, obviously I'm biased to the FBI's ERT. They're, in my opinion, the best in the world. If they were used the first time, there's a very high probability they were gonna get 99% of the evidence. You never get 100% because it's simple, simply an impossibility. So the likelihood it, it, that they're gonna find more evidence is fairly low because it's already been gone through several times. Plus, when you add in the concept of transference, then if there was any evidence uh, in there, it may have been destroyed or it may have been um, basically um, tainted, so to speak, because then you're gonna have other transference from investigators, their hairs and follicles, their things that might be in there. And then when you have that, essentially, nullifies any other anything else you find in there because then there's a, a built-in argument that the uh that anything you find in there was brought in versus it being there before the investigators got there the nearly one year since the murders makes evidence collection more difficult schmidt says but the same goes for the initial investigation according to court documents a surviving roommate dylan mortensen labeled in the affidavit as dm said she heard a male voice say something to the effect of, it's okay, I'm going to help you, just before 4.30 on the morning of the murders. The court document goes on to say Mortensen saw the suspect, describing, quote, the figure as 5'10 or taller, male, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. At the time, Mortensen said she stood in a frozen shock phase. It wasn't until hours later, at 11.58 a.m., the 911 call for the murderers came in. According to Schmidt, that initial time lapse could have caused issues. The longer the time elapses between the crime and the, the when professionals get there to search, there's a higher probability that the, the scene is going to be tainted with people walking in there that don't know what they're doing. They're moving, potentially moving bodies, moving sheets. What else, uh, you know, could happen? Uh, we don't know. I don't know what happened between the time of the crime and the time 911 was called. Uh, I can only suspect that the people, the the non-law enforcement that found these victims panicked and they didn't know what to do. They're not law enforcement. They're not going to think about present, uh, preserving a crime scene. They're going to, number one, they're going to think about how they preserve their own lives. Is the bad guy still there? So to answer your question, yes, that the two or three hours it took between the time of the crime and the time that the call was made, there was likely a lot of transference going on. And that's something that the FBI is going to try to overcome that concept or argument by the defense by doing this uh, crime scene reconstruction and being able to tell the jury, OK, if there was any transference, it was minimal because this is exactly what appeared to have happened. But Schmidt says if there's anything left to be found at the crime scene, FBI investigators will find it. I think it really comes down to the, the FBI, my bias opinion, is the, is the best evidence response team in the world. Uh, they, are, uh, they are the ones that tr they train everybody else in the world as well. Um, and they have the lab as well as they have teams there that they may or may not fly out as well as all 56 field offices have an ERT. And this is the type of stuff that the FBI, frankly, was created for, is to give that level of expertise that local law enforcement just doesn't have or access to. As of now, Koberger's trial is delayed indefinitely. And because of a court-ordered gag order, we won't learn more about the investigation from prosecutors or law enforcement, at least any time in the near future. Reporting for Long Crime Network, I'm Sierra Gillespie.